Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. It may look like the calm before the storm that is Hurricane Laura, but there is an awful lot going on along the Gulf Coast and beyond with state and local officials getting ready for a possible Category 3 hurricane. This is a live look at the Galveston seawall where the clouds have been rolling in all day. That's been about the only activity we've been able to see aside from some light traffic. Traffic heavier in parts of Houston, parts of Texas, meanwhile, under an evacuation order so people can clear out before the storm hits. Adam Kasky tracking that storm and we'll have the latest on when Hurricane Laura is expected to make landfall coming up in a few minutes. But first, closer to home, it is a matter of different philosophies and different constituents. That's how the local administrative judge explains why Kendall County has begun in person jury trials while a moratorium on jury service here in Bear County still remains in place. Paul Venema takes us to the Kendall County Courthouse where the first jury trial since March is now underway. We have uh, juror seats one, two, three in the actual jury box where we would normally have all 14. Judge Kirsten Cahoon said that she had two primary considerations in making the call to resume in-person jury trials. I take very seriously the, the citizens' uh, safety and health. I also take very seriously our constitutional obligations. Following CDC guidelines and county protocols, she set about making plans. I've had many sleepless nights, Paul. On this. It's face masks, shields, and social distancing, the order of the day for everyone. Our witnesses are completely covered in uh, plexiglass so that they can take off their mask and be questioned. The questioning will occur from the podium. Don't expect to see that here until at least early October. It's absolutely encouraging to see progress. But local administrative judge Ron Renhell says that any progress here depends on the numbers. Currently, the local positivity rate is 9.9%. The benchmark for us to consider bringing back live jury trials would be a positivity rate of 5% or less. In Kendall County, the numbers favor live trials, according to Judge Cohoon. Also facing a backlog, she's optimistic. We're going to take some things that we've learned through this process into our normal process that will be helpful and beneficial to our jury system. The next live jury trial here is set for October 5th. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Investigators with the New Braunfels and San Antonio Police Departments with a lot of sorting out to do as they try to figure out what led to a man and woman being shot and killed this morning. The woman was found in New Braunfels. The man was found in a crashed big rig here in San Antonio. They started out with reports of an accident around 2.30 this morning, leading investigators to discover the body of a 33-year-old woman inside an SUV. The wrecked SUV was found on the shoulder of I-35 North near a Walmart distribution center in New Braunfels. Police say the woman, who was from Austin, appeared to have been shot. Around the same time, more officers were called to a truck stop about a half mile away. Witnesses there say they heard several gunshots before then seeing an 18-wheeler speed away. At one point, he hit the barrier to the right side of the, of the freeway and the truck tilted almost going over um, and you saw a bunch of um, flames coming out of that and he kept going. The truck eventually did tilt over, crashing in downtown San Antonio. Police say the driver bailed out, but they found a man's body inside the cab of that truck. Officials say a suspect has been arrested, but they have not said who or what charges that person is facing. Ahead of the November election, getting real facts is crucial. That's why we're using our KSAT Trust Index to alert you about news sites that aren't exactly what they seem. A recent report from the Columbia Journalism Review found hundreds of sites are made to look like local news sites, but they're not. Courtney Friedman shows us that some that claim to be from South Texas and what you can look for to tell the difference. 
The names, the layouts, at first glance, these all seem like legitimate local news websites. But we looked closer and found they're what experts call pink slime websites. That's the term for low-cost automated news sites built to look like other credible news organizations. A report recently published by the Columbia Journalism Review shows the network of pink slime sites has increased to 450 sites in December 2019 to more than 1,200 in 2020. Another report by Duke University says these sites are owned, funded, or operated by political interest groups or dark money networks and have an agenda leading up to the 2020 election. Let's look at one company in particular, Metric Media, that owns a bunch of sites linked to our local area. The San Antonio Corridor News, San Antonio Standard, Hill Country Chronicle, North San Antonio News, South San Antonio News. These are supposedly different sites, but they look identical, don't they? And if you go to the top left hand corner, the drop down of Metric Media Texas Network, there are 56 of these sites with local names across the state that look exactly the same. Duke's study listed all the automated sites owned by Metric Media and showed its office is in Dover, Delaware, pretty far from the Lone Star State. These sites may feature real news subjects and stories pulled from legitimate news sites like the Texas Tribune, but the experts report information in the stories are sometimes manipulated. So we're giving this a be careful on the KSAT Trust Index. Here are some things you should consider when weeding out these types of websites. Look for a date stamp and an author byline. Can you tell who wrote the article? Has the article been published on other websites with key details and locations changed? Are they only using stock photos? And what information is on the Contact Us page? When in doubt, stick to the news outlets you already know and trust. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. If you have a website, a story, pictures, or video that you would like us to check out, submit it on our website. Just search KSAT Trust Index on KSAT.com. As students head back to virtual class and more parents are working from home, laptops are in unprecedented demand. In fact, there is a shortage as manufacturers and retailers try to keep up with tech needs around the world. The most challenging ones to find are some of the lower priced laptops and Chromebooks. So what's a frustrated shopper to do? See if you can find an equivalent model for the one that you're shopping for. You may also want to consider buying used or refurbished. And depending on where you buy it from, it may come with its own warranty. Now, to increase your odds of finding a laptop that meets your needs, Consumer Reports suggest you focus on features and not the brand. Consider going up in a, a bit in price where there is more availability and sign up for store alerts that notify you when an item is in stock. Third-party services like nowinstock.net and zoolert.com check inventory across several retailers for you. In time saver traffic now, let's look at the camera here at I-35 and Randolph. You can see what appears to be a stalled vehicle there, uh, a trailer or small camper there. It's all right in the, uh, the area in between the main lanes and the on-ramp here at I-35. Certainly not a great spot for something like this. So traffic slowing down to getting onto the highway and traffic slowing down continuing on I-35 at Randolph. We don't know if we're going to, if it goes to Louisiana, we have the clean side and we'll have this kind of conditions. If it's, if it comes straight in, then it's going to be a whole nother ball game. So we just don't know. Hundreds of thousands of people along the Gulf Coast in Texas and Louisiana have been ordered to evacuate as Hurricane Laura gets closer to making landfall. Laura now expected to be a Category 3 storm before it hits late Wednesday or early Thursday. And when it does hit, it is supposed to, the National Hurricane Center says that it could be devastating damage. Storm surge, heavy rain, strong winds, all expected. Laura's already proven to pack a deadly punch. Two dozen people in Haiti and the Dominican Republic have died because of this storm. And while Hurricane Laura is getting stronger in the warm waters of the Gulf, state officials aren't just waiting for the storm. They're telling anyone within 100 miles of Laura's projected cone they need to do what they need to do to stay safe, and for some, that means evacuations. Several evacuation sites are opening across the state, including right here in San Antonio. Our Tiffany Huertas is live on the city's east side, where the city has now set up a processing center where evacuees will need to check in when they get to town. So, Tiffany, has anyone arrived from coastal areas so far? 
Myra, we've seen several evacuees check in already. This has really picked up in the last hour. Just take a look. There's buses after buses, and several vehicles are waiting to check in as well. We are in the 200 block of Gambler Road, which opened at 3 this afternoon and will be run by the San Antonio Office of Emergency Management. This parking lot has been turned into a site where all displaced residents and evacuees will be checked in. Then they will head to their assigned shelter. The locations of those shelters will not be made public. Officials don't don't want people just showing up without being accounted for. In addition to making sure people can get to a safe place, other teams are mobilizing to help affected communities. And crews will be ready to go to start helping with clearing the damage. The Texas A&M Forest Service is providing incident management teams. They have already provided 25 ambulances with 75 more ordered, 87 boats. 200 buses, I'm sorry, yeah, 200 buses with another 200 order, 41 helicopters and planes and 152 high water vehicles. Earlier today, San Pedro Manor, a nursing home facility near San Antonio College, received 57 evacuees from a sister nursing home in Galveston. Staff says San Pedro Manor can accommodate 125 residents, and with the evacuees, there will now be a total of 123 residents. Now, a spokesperson for the San Antonio Fire Department just told me that some of the people that will be arriving here today will be from the Port Arthur area. We'll bring you the latest coming up tonight on the Night Beat. Reporting from the east side, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. No rain on the radar screen this afternoon, just a lot of sunshine you can see there with our live cam. And the latest on Hurricane Laura had a Category 1 storm right now. Winds of about 80 miles per hour. Those are the max sustained winds in the center of the storm. The track, well, it's making a beeline for the upper Texas and Louisiana coastline. We'll have a full update coming up in a few minutes. Response Coalition for COVID-19 here in San Antonio. And this is our nightly update of COVID-19 in San Antonio. We are reporting tonight 124 new cases of COVID-19, which brings the total to 45,488 in our community since the pandemic began. Our seven day moving average is now 145. Unfortunately, we have a number of new deaths to report tonight as well, uh, 16 in total, which brings the total since we began to 741 confirmed verified deaths. 14 of the 16 that we're reporting tonight are the result of Metro Health re reviewing death certificates provided by the state and confirming the deaths were COVID-19. These occurred between July 21st and August 18th. So this is part of those uh, cases under investigation from the state. And, and bear in mind uh, that as a number of uh, neighbors and friends and colleagues and family members we've lost, so please keep them in your prayers. Tonight we're reporting 458 people and in the hospital, down 15 from yesterday. 33 new admissions to the hospitals overnight, as well as 209 in the ICU and 139 on ventilators. Our capacity continues to improve. 59% of ventilators available and 15% of staffed hospital beds available. Our hospital system overall remains under high stress. Now, we've been talking a little bit about the models and how we can forecast what the pandemic is doing in our community. And until there is a vaccine, COVID-19, we know will remain a presence in our lives. The question has always been how much of a presence. We have the, the results of the new model from the company that has been used here in San Antonio and many cities across the country. It's called SG2. They have successfully predicted the height, the severity of the June and July spike that we experienced. And so there is some confidence in these models. And the model now shows us some encouraging news. If it's correct, we'll continue to see a decline in hospitalizations through September. In other words, there is a possibility, according to the model, if we keep doing what we know works, what we've been doing for the last month or so, we can avoid a fall surge and keep the hospitals from getting overwhelmed with COVID cases. That is encouraging, of course, after months of discouraging news, and it's a credit to everyone, all of you that have been paying attention to our public health professionals wearing masks and doing your physical distancing. We do want to caution, though, this is just a model, and there's still a lot to be learned about coronavirus across the country, and this model, of course, could prove to be wrong. The model projects hospitalizations only, not new cases of COVID-19, and of course, hospitalizations reflect only those the sickest among us. 
Let's use this model, of course, as a motivator rather than an excuse to let our guard down. We need to continue to practice what we know will stop the spread of COVID-19. And what we do know is that when people get together in large numbers without proper safety co protocols, COVID-19 cases spike. We don't want a repeat of Memorial Day or the spikes that we saw even after 4th of July during the upcomer, upcoming Labor Day weekend. So we should continue to work hard to keep those numbers down. Last thing before I talk it over to the judge. Every Tuesday, we we'll provide you with an update on the indicators we re that are related to the guidance to schools. The risk of in-person learning, in-classroom learning, is calculated by looking at the positivity rate in our community, the doubling rate, and the two-week decline of cases of COVID-19. This week, the positivity rate improved to 9.9 percent. We're finally in single digits, but we are aiming for 5 percent or less. The doubling time is now 40 days, which is uh, above our threshold, which is good. And finally, the 14-day case curve has shown a steady decline, but we want to see a decline without any rebounds in cases. So in sum, the school indicator bar has been lowered from high risk to medium risk, and this means in-person instruction is, is suggested only in small, very small pods of six students or less, with a maximum room capacity and building occupancy of 25 percent. Judge Wolf. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, hey, Jacob, thanks for the T-shirt. I'm sending you a book on the courthouse. One of these days you may become a judge. Uh, it was interesting what you were saying about the schools. We are in the yellow zone. We're still September 8th, a little less than two weeks away, I guess. And there are restrictions, as you stated, and also includes, uh, you know, school-sponsored events, including fairs, exhibits, et cetera, and the social distancing and the requirements there to, to, to not have a lot of extracurricular activity to begin with. Now, we don't know whether we'll be down to the green zone by September the 8th. Probably be pretty hard to do, it'd be my guess. So when schools do open, they're gonna have to really um, be careful if they're still shooting for that September the 8th uh, opening. Uh, you know, Colleen used a phrase that uh, the other day when we were talking about uh, domestic abuse, a shadow pandemic, uh, we are seeing domestic abuse go up. The, the uh, whole problem that we're facing with COVID, families together longer, the tension that is occurring with it. Uh, we've seen fi family violence, homicides uh, in the year 2020 exceed all of 2019 already and 18% spike in it. So we began the budget uh, deliberations today. And uh, while we have a very tight budget, we decided to uh, take some steps to uh, help this uh, problem that we're facing. Uh, first of all, there's an online digital protective order system which went in place on March the 20th. Uh, we took $500,000 in our uh, coronavirus relief funds and provided that for the Family Justice Center to be able to hire additional people. Uh, in the budget, we're putting another three positions for the district attorney's office for long-term support of the system. It includes a couple, a couple of more uh, uh, attorneys in that also. And then we've uh, acted on a recommendation that came from Colleen and um, uh, Judge Diaz and Judge Sakai with respect to the creation of a new court. And it would be a civil court that would uh, focus on protective orders. And we've seen a, a tremendous jump in the, in, in the protective orders that, are, <laughs> that, that have been requested. Uh, we approved 12 new positions in there uh, for a total cost of about $948,000. It provides them with um, associate new, new judge, uh, court manager, program assistants, crime advocates, uh, all the backup support that they need to make the court work. And hopefully uh, uh, this will help us uh, stem this tide of, uh, of uh, domestic violence. And as he said, County Judge Nelson Wolf, they're talking about another side effect of this pandemic. We have seen an increase in domestic violence cases here locally and uh, it, talking about how the county is dedicating more financial resources to combating that very significant problem. Uh, something will surely continue to follow. As for the numbers today, some encouraging news. We heard from the mayor talking about that SG2 model, which is really predicted where we're headed in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. He said so far it's been successful in predicting those June and July spikes we saw 
saw and that if it uh, pans out going forward, we could be continuing a decline in hospitalizations through the next month and could possibly avoid a fall surge like we've all been wary of uh, if we keep up the social distancing measures, the mask wearing measures, all things that have contributed to our numbers declining where they are now. And meanwhile, the indicators that they've been watching for return to school, uh, we have seen that drop from the high risk to, to moderate now, but even so, you know, they're, they're talking about that if kids were to go back to school under that, still only 25% of people in a building. So that would continue to be uh, very uh, small groups there and not looking like at September 8th, we're going to get to that 5%. So we could see further delays in getting kids back into classrooms. Something we'll definitely keep watching. Let's turn to the weather now because all eyes are on the tropics, Adam, to find out what exactly the impact is going to be on Texas. Yeah, and it's going to be in the upper Texas coastline for the most part, just east of Houston and into Louisiana there. So let's get a, the latest look at Laura. It's out in the central Gulf of Mexico. Max sustained winds 80 miles per hour. Category one hurricane for now. Likely to develop into a category two storm later tonight and then tomorrow and tomorrow night continue to strengthen. And then late tomorrow night, very early morning hours on Thursday, landfall somewhere along the upper Texas to Louisiana coastline here, basically near the state line. And of course, there's still some uncertainty with this, but that would be as a category three storm with some winds up to 115 miles per hour and the highest storm surge on the right hand side of that storm throughout a good chunk of Louisiana and a lot of rain. The rain, though, it's going to stay out of our area for the most part. We could get a few showers here and there, but you see the bulk of the real heavy moisture. And unfortunately, what will likely turn into some flooding rainfall as well will be up and down Louisiana into Arkansas as well. And right along the Texas Louisiana line there, we could see five to seven inches in that area. In our neck of the woods, we're not looking at much, mainly an isolated shower or two the next couple of days. Thursday, it wouldn't even be related to Laura. That would just be your typical garden variety pop up afternoon showers like we've seen periodically over the past couple of weeks. Right now we're in the upper 90s. We did top out at 100 briefly here in San Antonio, but as we go through the evening, mostly clear, a very gentle northeasterly breeze. Temperatures falling through the 80s and we'll settle in the 70s tomorrow morning with that 30% chance of rain the next couple of days. So just a few isolated showers and high temperatures right near 100. All right, thanks Adam. Greg Simmons has sports next. TSA Roadrunners are now just three weeks away from their season opener when they face Texas State in San Marcos on Saturday, September the 12th. And going into Saturday's scrimmage, as many as four players are vying for the starting quarterback position under new head coach Jeff Trailer, including Frank Harris, Lowell Narcisse, Jordan Weeks, who also action last year under Frank Wilson. And now you can add New Mexico State transfer Josh Atkins out of Smithson Valley. So is Trailer any closer today to solidifying his depth chart? Uh, we pretty much have it. It's just a matter of when we're going to release it, uh, you know, because we don't play till September 12th. And I don't see how it does any advantage just to put it out there. Uh, so we, we pretty much know right now. So he knows he's just not telling us. Remember, Harris was considered the heir apparent under Wilson before he blew out his knee in practice two years ago. And then last season injured his shoulder that ended his year in the fourth game of the season. The fight Texas Aggies are looking to improve on their 8-5 and five finish last year. That included 4-4 four and four in the SEC and Jimbo Fisher's second year as the Aggies head coach. And one position that has stepped up has been the linebacking core of the Aggie defense. Under Fisher and defensive coordinator Mike Elko, they have done everything in their power to return the maroon and white to their old wrecking crew days. Buddy Johnson is about to start his senior season where he's listed at 6'2", 230 pounds, starting all 13 games last season for 77 tackles, which is his third on the team. Remember, it was Johnson who came up with a game-saving fumble and 62 yard touchdown return on the road against Ole Miss that triggered a four game win streak for the Aggies. Now he wants to take it to the next level. I'm a lot more experienced, so I know what it takes. And, you know, uh, I raise my expectation for myself and, you know, the leadership that I demand from this team. And, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to keep, you know, make sure all the guys are on the same page and, you know, uh, just raising the standards, that's what it's all about. Being able to raise the standards, you know, higher than what they were last year, that's, that's what it's going to take. The Aggies will kick off their season when they host Vanderbilt on September the 26th at Kyle Field. Legendary track star Usain Bolt has contracted the coronavirus after celebrating his 34th birthday at a surprise party 
with no mask. Bolt still holds the world records for the 100 meter and 200 meter and the only athlete to win gold medals at three straight Olympics in 2008, 12 and 2016 before retiring in 2017. The eight time gold medalist posted this video on social media from his bed in Jamaica. Talk to all my friends and tell them that if you're not coming, contact commission just to be safe, quarantined by yourself and just to take it easy. And just to make people know, be safe out there. Well, he took the test on Saturday and the positive result came back today. He says he is not showing any symptoms, but keep in mind the coronavirus can have long term effects on the heart and lungs. San Antonio FC announced today that the club's remaining regular season home matches will host a limited number of fans at Toyota Field beginning Saturday, September the 5th. Officials say the decision was made to allow limited access by fans after continued dialogue with local, state, and public health officials under a 25% capacity plan. Seats will be offered to current SAFC season ticket holders and a number of fans to be capped at 2,000 temperature checks and a mandatory mask policy will be enforced inside the stadium for the safety and welfare of all the fans, staff, and players. San Antonio FC has played four home matches so far without fans and the only undefeated team in the USL. So this would be an added bonus, I think, even for the players and the team to welcome the fans back to help them keep this streak alive. Yeah, it'd be something to see. It will be. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. We are seeing our numbers improve locally when it comes to COVID-19. For today's KSAT Q&A, we want to bring in an expert we have relied on throughout this pandemic for information. Dr. Robert Froelichstein, a local emergency room physician with Methodist Healthcare. Doctor, good to see you as always. Thanks for being with us. Let's talk first about what you're seeing right now in the hospital. You know, it's uh, pretty encouraging lately. I think right now there are about half as many admitted patients in the San Antonio area as, as we saw one month ago. Um, but that's still four, five, almost 500 patients admitted to the hospital in San Antonio with COVID. So. It's encouraging that we're seeing decreases, but it's it's still out there. I'm still seeing patients in the emergency department with COVID, not as frequently, uh, but importantly, just as sick as they were. The severity of illness is not really changing at all, just the frequency. And that certainly seems to follow, Doctor, the SG2 model that was released by the city today in their daily briefing showing that it accurately predicted the spike that we saw in June and July. And it's now predicting that we should continue to see the numbers go down, at least the hospitalization numbers, if we continue doing what we're doing into September. What are your concerns uh, when it comes to the models as far as maybe providing a, a false sense of security for folks out there? You know, I, I kind of feel like where we were in, it feels the same as we, as mid to late May, right? Where we felt like we maybe had a handle on things and then Memorial Day hit and things took off. So I, I have the same concern with uh, uh, Labor Day coming up and back to school and will, I, I'm concerned, I think, Frankly, I think we'd be naive to think we won't see a resurgence um, probably around the 1st of October, somewhere around there. We just hopefully it will not be as severe as what we saw uh, this summer. Let's talk about back to school. We know the majority of local schools have not returned to in-person learning. Everything is online for the most part right now. Are hospitals preparing in any way for uh, potentially more pediatric patients once in-person learning resumes? Sure. Um, abs absolutely. I think, uh, you know, this is also the time we start seeing RSV and it will be a few months from now to be the flu. And so there are definitely plans to be able to um, care for normal illnesses we see in addition to the COVID. Since you just touched on the flu, let's talk about that. How important, I mean, it's always important to get the flu vaccine. How important is it this year with the coronavirus out there? And do you expect that it will be harder to get the flu vaccine this year? And when would be a good time to get it? Should you get it earlier or about the same time that you normally would? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be harder to get it. In fact, I think they're making uh, more doses than, than usual. Um, and I think the timing is it's always a little um variable i guess but probably any time in september maybe towards the later part of september is when to start getting the vaccine and the reason i think it's so important is that uh, if people don't get the flu vaccine then we're setting ourselves up for a pandemic of flu 
in addition to the pandemic of COVID. The way vaccines work, you know, there's all people always say, oh, it's only 60% sensitive or 60% effective. Why should I get it? It's, I still might get the flu. Well, that's true. But if, if it's 60% effective, then that means uh, instead of one person having a flu, spreading it to two or three, they may only spread it to one. And that's how you control a pandemic is decreasing the amount of spread. And so I think it's very, very important to get the, the flu vaccine this year. You yourself are a frontline worker. We have talked to you here about one of your big concerns uh, several weeks ago when we were really at the height of this was whether local health care workers were going to be able con to continue keeping up the stamina that you all have had to have had uh, over these last couple of months. How are your colleagues doing right now? How are our health care workers faring at this point? You know, I, amazingly well. Um, I mean, I could be more proud of my, our team. Um, people have are still coming in with a great attitude. And, and uh, you know, I think the overall, though, we feel pretty safe in the emergency department with our the protective gear we have and the processes in place. Uh, so I don't think that fear is there anymore, but it's still grueling. It's still hard to see people this ill with this virus. Uh, so we just got to stick with it. All right, Dr. Robert Froelichstein, thanks as always for being with us. We'll surely be talking to you again soon. Take care. Hey, thank you very much. We'll be right back. Can you go 48 hours without the internet or smartphone data? If you want to find out, this contest might be right up your alley. A Salt Lake City company is willing to pay someone $1,000 to do a 48-hour digital detox. They won't supply you with the RV, but they will reimburse you for the rental if you win, separate from the $1,000 prize. The company, Satellite Internet, which helps people get online in remote places, says it wants everyone to enjoy the great outdoors. At the end of the 48 hours, Satellite Internet will provide the winner with a digital hotspot to reconnect from wherever they are. Of course, they are expecting the person to participate to share their digital detox offline experience. And details are on the Satellite Internet website. I'm pretty antisocial. I think I could do that in no problem. <laughs> 48 hours, let's do 48 days. I, Tim, I think you would win that contest in a heartbeat. No All problem. Right. Last man standing at the challenge, right? Dan Gerber. <laughs> Gerber be saying what challenge? <laughs> challenge. That's my phone in the lake right when I got here. That's right. <laughs> oh, look at all that sunshine out there. 97 right now after a high temperature of 100 today. We briefly hit the century mark. And as we go through the evening, clear sky, hardly a breeze out there. And we'll still be in the mid 90s at 8 p.m., but by 10 p.m., down into the mid, mid 80s. And all eyes are on Hurricane Laura in the Gulf. We're going to talk about that, where it's likely to make landfall and its impacts coming up. Oh, it is very much August, and especially here in South Texas, a lot of us wishing for fall and cooler temperatures. Well, what we are getting, those fall flavors earlier than ever. You've probably seen them, even had something with pumpkin in it already. Well, pumpkin spice latte lovers will not have to wait any longer for their fix. We're still doing this, huh? Starbucks <laughs> is jumping on the bandwagon, releasing all its fall favorites earlier than ever this year, besides the PSL. The uh, new menu options are pumpkin cream cold brew or salted caramel mocha or frap. Uh, bakery items too, like pumpkin bread or scone and pumpkin cream cheese muffins are all on the fall menu. These are all available starting today if that's your thing. I can tell PSL is right up your alley. I don't even I know can, what it is. I can sense I'm that. guessing pumpkin spice latte? Yes, talk to okay. Katie Blake. All right. A couple of new items hitting the menu at McDonald's. They are not pumpkin related. Spicy Chicken McNuggets and the Chips Ahoy McFlurry. Spicy McNuggets, the first new McNuggets flavor in the U.S. since they hit the menus back in 1983. The spicy version has a breaded tempura coating of cayenne and chili peppers. Now this I can get behind. They come <laughs> with the company's first new dipping sauce in three years, Mighty Hot Sauce, which is a blend of crushed red pepper, spicy chilies, and garlic. As for the Chips Ahoy McFlurry, about what you would expect. A vanilla soft serve ice cream, Chips Ahoy cookie piece 
spices and caramel topping. Both will hit U.S. restaurants on September 16th and will be available for a limited time. I might be in line for this. Yeah, I felt more enthusiasm. Yeah. yeah. 104 years ago today, the National Park Service was created by President Woodrow Wilson. To mark that momentous day, August 25th is National Park Service Founders Day. Entry to the parks on that day typically free. The service, which is part of the Interior Department, started with 35 parks and monuments. It now oversees 400 sites across all 50 states, U.S. territories, and Washington, D.C. They add up to 84 million acres. Get out there and check one of them out. Yeah, there's so many. I want to go visit. Mm -hmm. big, big bucket list. Big Bend National Park. Yeah, that's, that's a good a one. That's a great one. Oh, I been is to that it? One. Uh, yeah, go when there's. A new moon, so you don't have moonlight getting in the way of your stargazing. Ah, yeah. okay. Good tip. Yes. Oh, it's unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> you got me started now. All right, let's take a look first at uh, Hurricane Laura. We want to talk about that before we jump into our rain chances and uh, what we could get from any of this activity. Right now, Hurricane Laura, Category 1 hurricane in the Central Gulf, moving to the west-northwest at 17 miles per hour. Central pressure at 990 millibars, and that number is going to drop significantly and pretty quickly here just over the next day and a half. Now, even later tonight, it's likely to become a Category 2. Then, as we get into Wednesday, still offshore midday as a Category 2, but there is that high potential of it turning into Category 3 hurricane right before landfall. And landfall would be late tomorrow night and in the very early morning hours of Thursday. As for location, the upper Texas coast, basically somewhere near the Texas-Louisiana line, right along the coast there. And it's going to have high winds, 115 miles per hour, some higher gusts close to the center of that storm around the eye wall there. And, of course, a strong storm surge, a big storm surge, but that's going to be on the eastern side here in the right front quadrant that pushes the water up onto the shore. So not as much of a storm surge on the Texas side here because the wind will be blowing out basically offshore and there is the potential for this track to start nudging a little bit westward in future updates and uh, forecasts as we get more information and one reason here is we have more divergence in the computer models right now and they're starting to spread out a little bit more and even get a little bit closer to Houston so it wouldn't be wouldn't be surprising if Houston actually gets nudged just barely within that cone of uncertainty but right now they're not included and then you see even the remnants of this tracking to the north and then east. So the path, of course, carrying the heavy rainfall with it all the way up into Memphis, you get Tennessee, Kentucky, a lot of rain associated with it, even just the leftovers. That's what we need, leftovers of a tropical system or just a weak tropical system to alleviate our drought. This is all headed eastward. It's no surprise that the heaviest rain will be right along the path, but of course, too much of a good thing for parts of Louisiana and even East Texas. I mean, we could be talking nearly seven to nine inches of rain in and around the Lake Charles area, you get into Beaumont as well, five plus inches of rainfall. Here, we could have a few showers and that would be it. And that would mainly be a 30% chance. So notice as we get into tomorrow, we'll have some spotty light showers developing, especially in our eastern counties, about 30% coverage for the afternoon. And then even when the storm makes landfall by tomorrow night, I think we'll have a clear sky, just some high cirrus clouds coming off the top of that storm. We get into Thursday, typical garden variety pop up afternoon showers, not even really related to Laura, just your typical uh, activity that we've seen several afternoons over the past couple of weeks. That spotty hit or miss splash and dash shower activity. 100, that was our high today. The record, 102, so back in 06. The average now is 96. And across the state, we're mostly in the 90s. And the 90s stretch up the plains. So we're all feeling that warmth, the heat, the August heat. Right now we're 97 in town and by tomorrow morning we'll be in the mid 70s. 98, the high temperature becoming partly cloudy. That 30% chance the next couple of days 20% on Friday, so minimal rain coverage here for the rest of this week and even through the weekend. Basically, anticipate more of the same. Partly cloudy and every so often some hit or miss showers. All right. The broken record of August continues to skip along. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It.
Anyone within 100 miles of Hurricane Laura's projected cone needs to take precaution as the storm heads towards the Gulf Coast. This was a message from Governor Greg Abbott today. Today, the governor announcing several evacuation sites across the state, including one right here in San Antonio. Take a look at this setup at the 200 block of Gembler Road. This location opened at 3 p.m. The San Antonio Office of Emergency Management is running this operation. The parking lot has been turned into a site where all displaced residents and evacuees will be checked in and then they will head to the shelter locations. Police are looking for a gunman after a fight ended with bullets flying on the city's northeast side. Now, police tell us two men were arguing when one person pulled out a gun and shot the other man in the head. The shooter then took off running. The victim was taken to the hospital. Witnesses could only give police a vague description of the suspect that ran off, saying he was wearing orange shorts. Unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin continues after a 29-year-old man was shot by an officer over the weekend. Jacob Blake's family attorney saying today Blake is now paralyzed from the waist down. He was shot Sunday after officers were called to a domestic disturbance. The Wisconsin Department of Justice is now investigating. The two officers involved are on leave and a curfew has been issued for a third day in a row. Donut infused beer. That's the latest from Dunkin' Donuts after they teamed up with Harpoon Brewery. Previously, Harpoon released the Dunkin' Coffee Porter. After that success, they decided to try brewing actual Dunkin' Donuts into the ale. The Dunkin' Pumpkin Spiced Latte Ale, Boston Cream Stout, and Jelly Donut IPA hit stores next month. All right, looking at the wind forecast here, as you get into Wednesday evening, you can see the tropical storm force winds in yellow starting to work their way into the Louisiana and upper Texas coastlines. And then the hurricane force later on Wednesday night into the very early morning hours on Thursday. The exact landfall is still a little uncertain, but it's going to be somewhere near the Texas-Louisiana state line. And most of the rain is going to stay far out of our area as well. All right, thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the News at 6. See you back here for the night beat at 10.